Hi there, welcome to episode two of Ask Paul Kirtley. We've got some more great questions today. We're gonna to be talking about bivy bags and tarps. We're gonna be talking about wrist watches, and we're also gonna be talking about titanium cooking pots. So, first question. Buddy says that he's been thinking of upgrading his tarp to a Hurven bag. Is this a good idea? Okay, yeah. So, Buddy, yeah, thanks. You were replying to one of my tweets here about tarps and you were talking about upgrading to a Jurven bag. Um, for those of you that don't know what they are, Fjellduken, it's a Norwegian, it's, some of them are lined, some of them are unlined. Um, you can zip them into various configurations. Um, they were originally designed to, to be sort of camouflage for hunters. Um, you can basically sort of sit in this quilted camouflage bag that looks a bit like a rock, and, uh, but you can also turn them into tarps, use them as sleeping bags, use them as uh, hammock liners and that type of thing. They're a really versatile piece of kit. Um, I've got one of each. I've got a, a lined one and an unlined one. And um, they are quite expensive for what they are. That's the first thing I would say. Um, the lined one's reasonably warm for sitting there. If you want to sit still on a mountainside waiting for, for some wildlife to come by, whether you're taking photographs or you're hunting or um, just observing with binoculars, they're very good for that. Um, they're good for uh, scaring walkers as well. The one that I've got looks like a granite rock with green lichen on it. Um, it's very camouflage and people don't see you until you move and it scares the hell out of them. So they're, they're quite good for that perspective as well. Same with the unlined one. The unlined one's just not as warm. It's also lighter. If you're thinking about getting an unlined one as, a, as your main tarp, if that's the main reason for buying it, I would say buy a tarp because it probably costs you less and it's, and it's specifically made for that job. Particularly modern silicon nylon tarps are so light, um, if, you, if you want a tarp as a main thing, spend the money on a silicon nylon tarp rather than spending the money on something that will work as a tarp but is also designed to do other things. As for the lined Yervin bag, they're, a, they're quite a fun thing to have in your, and useful to have in your day pack, particularly in the colder months. Um, as I say, they're warm to sit in, so even if you're just stopping to have a brew, have a drink, have your lunch, you can sit inside and it'll keep you nice and warm. They're also a good sort of emergency thing to have if you, if there's a chance you might end up staying out over the, overnight, but you know, you're not planning to, you can use it during the day for stopping, keeping warm. You can put it up as a tarp if you want to. You can sit inside it as a quilted sort of jacket almost. Um, you can use it as an emergency sleeping bag, but it's not going to be as warm as a sleeping bag. And that's the thing. You know, if you're planning to spend the night out, I would pack a, a lightweight down sleeping bag and a bivy bag rather than take a Yervin bag because they're again um, they're about a kilogram so a good lightweight sleeping bag and a bivy bag is going to weigh about the same so it's again the argument do you want something that's a jack of all trades or are you buying it to do a specific thing so I think a, Ye a quilted Yervin bag good to have in your day pack use it for staying warm during the day you can use it to sleep out if you absolutely have to unlined will work as a tarp can use but can be used for camouflage but if it's primary purposes for a tarp buy a really good silicon nylon tarp it'll weigh less and it probably won't cost any more either good question buddy woodman asks what is your view on titanium cooking pots okay woodman view on titanium cooking pots um short version is they're expensive but they're very light and they're tough um and so whether or not in terms of a subjective view um, whether or not people should own them, it really is down to you. Um, I've got stainless steel cooking pots, I've got aluminium cooking pots, and I've got titanium cooking pots. And what I decide to take with me really depends on what I'm doing. And I tend to take the titanium stuff, um, I've got a titanium mug, um, MSR, and titanium cooking pots. They tend to come with me when I'm backpacking and weight is critical. Um, when I'm doing a canoe journey and I might be spending a bit more time in the evenings cooking because I can take a, a wider variety of food, 
and I might want a wider variety of cooking pots, I'd take a nested set of, of stainless steel pots. In between, for sort of general purpose, I'm intending to use aluminium pots now, the hard anodized aluminium I, I'm quite liking because it's not that expensive, um, it's relatively tough, it's easy to clean and it's relatively light, so it's a nice in-between. Stainless steel, super easy to clean, um, tough but weighs more. Titanium, not the easiest to clean either, a bit like the hard anodized uh, aluminium, but super lightweight and you pick the thing up and it, and it weighs nothing. Um, so yeah, titanium is worth having if weight is absolutely critical. And the only time for me weight's absolutely critical is when it's on my back and I'm also carrying a reasonable amount of food and other equipment where I just want to try and minimize the weight of every single piece. Otherwise, probably get some hard anodized aluminium or even um, stick with a very simple stainless steel setup. And it depends on your budget, you know, because it is, you know, you're gonna pay five times um, what you pay for a stainless steel uh, mug, what you pay for a titanium mug, really, for good, for similar quality, similar utility. So that, that's my view. It really is function versus cost, again, and what's critical. Um, it's like, people ask me about sleeping bags. What's the best sleeping bag to buy? It depends what you're doing. Um, it depends what time of year you're going out. Um, do you need it to, to, to span a, a range of seasons? Is it for a specific season? Is weight absolutely critical? Um, it, it's always the case. You have to specify the, the issue. There isn't one answer that fits everybody. So I like titanium, but for particular purposes. Thomas says, I'm currently looking into buying a bivy bag. Previously, I was thinking about buying the Alpkit Hunker XL to make sure that my Exped sleeping mat as well as my winter sleeping bag fits in. The only reason I didn't do so yet was because the bivy doesn't have a zipper at the front or side, so I think it may be a bit of a pain to get in or out. After seeing your recent video on lightening your weight, I'm comparing the Hunker with your Snug Pack SF bivy. Weight and size are about the same, but the Snug Pack is about 100 euro versus 70 euro for the Alpkit. So my two questions are, would you recommend me to go for the one with a zipper so that one could leave it open during the night if the weather isn't that bad? Or would you recommend me go for a larger one? Or do you think the Snug Pack SF bivy is large enough even for the standard size inflation mats plus sleeping bag? I would highly appreciate any opinion or input from your side. Okay. And that was from Thomas. Thomas. Sorry, long question. Um, I think there's probably two, maybe three fundamental questions in there. The first one is zipped versus unzipped. Um, and your question about unzipped, I think misses the point slightly. Um, you're, you're talking about a little bit like a sleeping bag. You're thinking about, is it good to be able to unzip for temperature? I think the main advantage to having a, a zip in your bivy bag, particularly a central zip, is that you can sit up in the bivy bag without pulling it all up behind you. If you think about being in a bivy bag that doesn't have a zip, as soon as you sit up, it's all pulling up behind you. If you've got stuff on it that's your, um, that's your pillow and, and you know, you've put your, your fleece down or you put things down for your pillow, you sit up, you're pulling all that around and you have to reset it as you're lying down. That can be a pain. Um, in colder environments, when you need to be getting dressed and undressed in the sleeping bag, I would say it's most critical to have a central zip bivy and a central zip sleeping bag if you're bivying outside in sub-zero temperatures. Um, otherwise, it's kind of a bit of a luxury. Do you want to be able to sit up in your sleeping bag, in your bivy, without riving everything, uh, pulling everything around um, behind you? maybe and then i would say a, a third um, consideration a tertiary consideration is one of um, being too warm or not because frankly it's the sleeping bag that's going to make a lot of difference um, unzipping a sleeping bag inside a, a, a non-zipped bivy bag will make a big temperature difference um, as long as the bag is breathable which the ones you're comparing are breathable then it really is a question of convenience um, rather than temperature regulation And then I think the second question really is about which one will fit a full size sleeping mat in. Now I've used the, the snug pack, I've not used the Alp kit um, and I'm not familiar with the relative sizings off the top of my head, uh, apologies. Um, what I will say about the snug pack is it's quite small. Um, it, it is a lightweight bag. Um, it's not too small for me, I'm, I'm six foot one, I'm sort of one, 1.8 meters and a bit tall. Um, I fit in it fine. 
uh, in the standard length one, um, I think I, I would have more room in the longer length one. And if I was going to use a full length sleeping mat, I would want the longer length one because it tapers and narrows towards the feet. And I think it would make it quite tight around the feet for me if I had a full size sleeping mat in there. But I use a three quarter length sleeping mat. So I, I don't have that, have that issue. Um, beyond that, I think it, what you're comparing is it, you sort of, both are going to work well. Uh, both are going to work well in bad weather. Um, both companies have got good reputations. Both are breathable bags. So it's really a question of whether or not you want the utility of a central zip. And that really depends on whether or not you want to sit up or not in your sleeping bag, whether that's something that's really important to you. I think that's the critical question you need to ask. The other stuff then is, is, is secondary to that. So I hope that helps. Mike says, I know this may be an odd question, but aside from tracking and bushcraft, I have an infatuation with watches. I often see Mr. Kirtley wearing what looks like an automatic Omega Seamaster. When I go out to wild places and swing an axe, I always remove my automatic watches to avoid damaging them with shock. It's a great pain to do so when swinging an axe a lot, but I worry about my watches. Does Mr. Kirtley leave his watches on when swinging axes? If so, has it caused a problem with his timepieces? Any advice is much appreciated. Mike, yeah. Okay, good question, Mike. Um, not one that I've been asked before, but it is a good question. Um, and it's an interesting one because I, you're right, um, the watch I use mainly is an Amiga Seamaster, it is an automatic, and um, I keep it on most of the time. That's one of the reasons I have it. It has a, a, a metal uh, bracelet, and um, you know, I've bought it for outdoor use. I've used it for diving, use it for canoeing, use it generally outdoors. I, I like the, uh, the bezel um, that I can use as a timer when navigating. It's a great outdoors watch. Um, it's also pretty tough in my experience. I mean, I've owned mine for six, seven, eight years now. Yeah, eight years. And um, it, it, I've never had a problem with it. I don't get it serviced as often as they recommend. Um, I use it, um, I swing axes with it all the time. I do wear it on my left hand and I am right-handed, so I guess maybe the right gets a bit more shock, but I don't, tend, I don't take it on, on and off um, when I'm doing anything, to be honest with you. Um, so no, never had a problem with that. The other watch that I have, that I tend to wear more in cold climates because it, doesn't have, it has a leather strap rather than having lots of metal um, in contact with my, um, with my wrist, and also it's got a slightly lower profile, so it's easy with cuffs particularly multiple cuffs and mittens, um, is an IWC uh, Mark 12 Pilot's watch. Um, that's a watch I've owned for nearly 20 years. And again, it's an automatic. I like automatics because um, they don't rely on batteries. And so when I'm out in the middle of nowhere, it's not gonna suddenly die. Um, so I, I like automatics for that reason. Again, IWC, I've not had a problem with that. Um, Again, swinging axes a lot in the winter for winter firewood on winter camping trips. Never had a problem with it. Um, the timekeeping isn't any worse or better as a result of, in my experience, of swinging axes or doing any other outdoor activities with it, um, with either of them. So yeah, I would say maybe maybe don't worry so much and uh, and enjoy this axe swinging a little bit more. But good question, interesting one. Not not one that I expect to, expected to get. So uh, cool. Thanks for that. Jorge says, I'm relatively new to bushcrafting, but not new to being in the outdoors or being an outdoorsman. I come from the school of thought of ultralight camping and hammocking has been a way of being for me since 2005. He asks, it might be too simple a question, but what do you suggest in apparel when bushcrafting, in all types of weather or seasons? Also, in the cooking department, what food do you recommend when in the bush? I'm sure these are relatively easy questions, but I always feel it is better to ask than guess and be wrong when your life depends on it. Okay, so that's kind of, on the face of it, it's a two-part question, but I would, as a theme, I would say don't stress about things to do with bushcraft specifically, because to me, a lot of what bushcraft is goes along with other activities. So for example, um, I think bushcraft goes really well with modern lightweight hiking, because one of the central tenets of bushcraft is the more you know, the less you carry. And clearly when you're, when you're hiking, um, 
you want to carry less. Um, you want less on your back, you know, and that's why you've got all the lightweight stuff. So I think you can meld the two quite nicely. I don't think you need to necessarily invest in a completely new wardrobe just because you're doing bushcraft now all of a sudden. I think you can, you can meld it with what you already do. Clearly there are issues if you've got like a gossamer thin waterproof um, and you start hiking logs and, and firewood and things onto your shoulders and you're pushing through the bush a bit more to get to particular resources, you're going to trash your, your, your really thin, um, sensitive, lightweight, uh, waterproof that's going to keep the rain off as long as that's all that's touching it. But as soon as you start pushing um, on, you know, bark and thorns and that sort of thing, you maybe need something a bit tougher. So go for a heavier weight, you know, triple layer Gore-Tex jacket that's designed for, for rougher use um, or go for a ventile jacket or something like that that's going to be, that's going to be tough. But otherwise, I don't think there's a particular bushcraft uniform that you need to wear. Um, a lot of people think there is, and I think that puts certain people off. I think you can go out in the outdoors as long as you've got a waterproof jacket and some boots that you know that are suitable or shoes that are suitable for where you're going. You can go and do bushcraft activities. Um, you can go and train in bushcraft skills. You need a knife, perhaps. You maybe need a saw. Maybe you need a fire steel, um, so you can practice different fire lighting techniques without going to friction fire lighting techniques. But other than that, you don't really need a lot. Um, so you don't worry about the kit. Worry about what you need to know. And that's the thing that most people scrimp on, frankly. They'll go and spend a lot of money on particular clothing, particular equipment, and then they don't spend a lot of time on what they need to know. And at the heart of bushcraft is a knowledge of nature. It's a knowledge of the natural resources that you can use, um, the rhythms of nature, um, how nature behaves, the weather, natural navigation, the, what you can use for fire, what you can use for cordage, what you, how you can find water when it's not obvious, all of those things. Spend time learning those things. Go out and observe and enjoy being out for those reasons. Um, an ally to that, you asked about cooking. One of the things about having a fire, which I guess is more central to what's perceived as bushcraft as opposed to lightweight hiking, modern lightweight hiking, generally people are using little meth stoves and little titanium mugs and, and various things that don't really, um, maybe they're using one of the, a honey stove or something where you're popping twigs in, but mostly you're not taking stuff from the environment. The thing, as soon as you have a campfire, you've got a great atmosphere that you can enjoy, um, but you've also got a great facility for cooking if you manage that well. So I would encourage you to do everything from quick um, sort of boil meals to uh, slow cook stews, to roasting things over the fire, roasting fish, roasting meats over the fire, you know, all the sorts of things you enjoy cooking at home. See if you can do them in the woods. And there are some specifically great meals that you can cook um, with really good embers in terms of roasting, in terms of um, slow cooking. If you get hold of a Dutch oven, if not something I would ever hike or even canoe with, but vehicle-based camping, um, Dutch ovens are fantastic. You can anything you can cook in an oven at home, you can cook in a Dutch oven in camp. And so, if you have the opportunity to to, to explore that side of cooking, that you can make some fantastically tasty meals. So that that's what I'd recommend. Get that campfire management sorted. Um, and again, it's knowledge of which firewoods give you the best embers, um, which ones are going to burn quickly for boiling, how do you prepare the wood so sometimes you want it to, to burn quickly, how do you arrange a, a, a fire lay where you're cooking various different things, you're boiling potatoes, you're roasting meat, um, you're doing other things in between. Um, that kind of skill is worth practicing because you can turn out amazing meals for people and they're very appreciative if, you, if you're camping with other people and traveling with other people. So that's to me one of the great things about campfire cookery is that there's that social aspect is a nice environment to be in anyway around the campfire and then if you can turn out some wonderful meals that, that, that um, really delight people's senses then that's a great thing to do. So I would, I would encourage that. Don't worry so much about the kit enjoy the resources, enjoy learning how to use them, enjoy being out in nature and enjoy camping with other people and producing some really nice meals. Um, that's, what I'd, that's what I'd go for. So that's that, that was the fifth question, wasn't it? So that brings us to the end of the second episode of Ask Paul Kirtley. We got on to some um, points about natural resources and using things from nature and different firewoods and, and that side of things. 
more questions along those lines, please. What can I use? How do I do this? That sort of thing. Absolutely love those sorts of questions. And of course, always happy to help with equipment choices or places to go, um, activities around bushcraft skills as well. Send in your questions, hashtag Ask Paul Kirtley via Twitter, my, tweet me at pkirt, at P-K-I-R-T, that's at P-K-I-R-T, or um, go to my blog, send me a message via my contact form there. You can go to contact, send me a message, put Ask Paul Kirtley, that comes to my email inbox. I can search on Ask Paul Kirtley and I can find all the questions all at the same time when I'm doing these videos. And also on my blog, if there's a, there's a tab at the top in the menu, well, you can click on it where it says Ask Paul. It's got all the details I've just told you about how to contact me in other ways, but also on that page is a voice recorder that if you click on it, then you can record me a message there and then that comes to me and I can include that in, in, the, uh, in the audio for the video and the podcast. Um, and it's nice to hear people asking the questions personally. Um, so please, I encourage you to do that as well. And uh, Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching if you're watching uh, on video. Thanks for listening if you're listening on podcast. And thanks for sending in your questions. Keep sending them in. Apologies if your question hasn't been answered yet. I will try and get to more questions um, in episode three and hopefully your question will be answered. Keep trying, I will answer your questions. And uh, we'll see you on the next one or you'll hear me on the next one. Take care.